Okay, welcome back. We're looking at another game now from yesterday, and this was between Vladimir Kramnik and Judith Polgar. Vladimir Kramnik playing white kicked off with the English opening. So the battle for the d5 square commences, or will it transpose into a queen's gambit declined or something like that? Well, we see after knight f6. Knight c3 remains more in English opening territory with black playing c5. So g3. Okay. The idea of the English is to try and establish control of d5 principally. Not too much opening theory, or rather less than 1 e4, less theoretically analyzed. Knight c6, bishop g2. And we see now d6 from Judith and maybe she was taken a little bit by surprise by this choice of opening by Vladimir um, after e3 of course well usually white would like to play d4 and put the knight maybe on e2 here and black's next move seems kind of logical in trying to discourage the move d4. Black plays e5, but it is committing structurally to d5 being a bit more sensitive than usual in this structure. And white also has a lever plan of playing for b4 and using that b file, trying to get some pressure on b7 potentially. That's another plan in reserve. So Will this be an aggressive treatment of the English opening or more wet lettuce, as I might have said when I played the English myself? So knight g e2, bishop e6. And if white does play d3, I think it will go into wet lettuce territory. Black will play d5 energetically with a fantastic game, intuitively. So in this position, it is, it is important to look at the trade-offs. If d3, d5, then you know what? What is Black's problem structurally? Nothing. Black's got nice pieces. Uh, white can try and make use of c5. It's just fundamentally, it would seem a passive position with the d file ready to uh, target d3 as well. So this next move seems virtually forced. Actually, White plays knight d5 just to prevent d5 from Black, and doesn't mind uh, a pawn there. You can follow up with e4 later. And if Vladimir, Vladimir mentioned himself after the game, actually, there's a plan then of White just switching plans for f4. So he doesn't mind the exchange on d5. He'll play cd, e4, and then later f4. So change of plans, flexibility is needed to play the English opening with great delicacy according to what Black does. So bishop e7 is played. Both sides now castle. And now reinforcement of the d5 knight with knight ec3. And now a uh, very interesting sequence here. Knight b4. Black wants some dynamism clearly. Juliet is challenging uh, that knight again. And a very interesting decision strategically here. And also to do with precise timing. White takes on e7. It brings the queen away from bearing for d5 as a breakout. And in this position, though, black now seems to be threatening knight d3. So is there time, as well as bishop c4, is there time for d3? Well, that's the big question. Vladimir thought there was time for d3 here. And he played it. Now, was this next move uh, a mark of brilliant preparation on Juliet Polgar's part? If she doesn't play d5 now, if she humbly retreats the knight, then d5 is under white's control, and then maybe later b4, b takes c5, and that's what the English player really likes. b file pressure as well, light square pressure. 
So she breaks out now with d5, offering actually a very interesting idea is now on the cards. Guess what black plays in this position instead of retreating the knight? If I give you 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, very dynamic idea, d takes c4. So why is Judith sacrificing a knight? Well, this bishop's going to be at home for quite a few moves. Uh, this one thing, this d file, she's going to collect quite a few pawns potentially. The knight sacrifice is accepted here. I think um, I am Lawrence Trent and um, other commentators were intuitively thinking that uh, White's going to be able to consolidate at this point. Somehow, Kramnik will find a way of solving the problems here. But um, okay, for the moment, C takes B4. Piece for two pawns at the moment. Very dynamic position. So that's got all her pawns at the moment. Four, five, six, seven, eight. White down to three, four, five, six, six pawns. Knight e4. We see a third pawn on the cards for munching. After knight takes e4, bishop takes f5, bishop retreats. Not too much else. Rook fd8, pinning d3. So now three pawns for this bishop, which is still at home. Doesn't seem too bad a deal. In principle but is it actually easy to win this third pawn no not without a fight actually because Vladimir now plays d4 of course he can play d4 so it's two pawns for the bishop is it unsound intuitively um, I, I, I think I would I would say it's, it looks unsound at this at this point. Uh, two pawns for the bishop, even though the bishop's not got much scope at the moment. Queen e2, e4. Okay, shutting down this bishop, but there's always f3 on the cards, and f3 is played actually immediately here to break out. Bishop d5. F takes e4, F takes e4. And now rook f5. Giving the idea that maybe uh, rook e5 is on the cards, as well as bishop d2 and, and doubling, or even potentially queen h5 to put pressure on d5 laterally. Any g6 can be, or well, that can be pinned with queen g4, creating a weakness. So it seems as though Black's got a lot of proof to give here of the peace sacrifice. Are these pawns actually going to be that useful? Queen d7, and we see rook e5 in this position. Maybe there's some other choices as well to consider. Well, they could be too dangerous. But uh, rook e5, we'll check those out. And the second pass, rook e8. In this position now, the forcing move bishop h3 is made use of. To try and get this bishop in exchange. Queen c6. White took on e8. Queen takes e8. And now bishop d2. If this bishop comes off the first rank, then even bishop takes b4 is immediately on the cards because of that pin. So queen e7 factors that in protecting b4. With the queen. Now, forcing move again. Queen h5. What to do about the bishop? B queen d8. And now rook f1. It just looks as though this is not convincing at the moment for being a bishop down. Threats are emerging here. Uh, for example, rook f5 looks unpleasant, potentially. Just to scoop up, maybe uh, if Black's not careful, the a5 pawn or just installing itself on e5 again. So g6 is played. Okay. At least that rules out rook f5. Queen 
e5 though and now bishop e6 looks pretty nasty you can imagine well white is a piece up piece up rook a6 defending e6 uh, but here is a bit of a crunching move unfortunately for Judah I wonder if you can spot it if I give you 10 seconds starting from now what does Vladimir Kramnik play in this position okay he plays bishop d7 ouch if queen takes d7 it's a fourth mate check queen f8 is mate so white's now immediately threatening queen takes d5 as well as well as queen e8 just getting queen as an option but i'm not even sure that's the best so bishop f7 And now, uh, just exposing Black's king safety, sacking exchange here. King takes bishop b4, bishop b5 rather, double attacking c4 and a6. Also, e4 is ready to drop now, of course. Rook f6 takes that pawn, takes e4. These this bishop's handling f1. Um, it looks fairly miserable this position what is white actually fretting now let's just well we'll check in the second pass though okay queen c7 attacking the bishop the bishop's protected queen d5 also queen g8 now is on the cards rook f8 protecting g8 e4 that introduces now bishop f4 and then bishop e5 is going to be nasty Among other things, b5, attacking the bishop, that's just taken with the queen. Queen d6, check, king h8. Now the d4 problem is solved with queen a7. Uh, so there's still menacing threats like bishop h6 now is a threat, just on g7. So g5 is played here. That is just simply taken in this position though. Queen c6. Doesn't help black too much. Queen e7. And uh, now Juliet resigns. So the peace sacrifice wasn't that sound after all. <laughs> uh, from the evidence of this game. But let's, let's check it out uh, in the second pass. Okay, so the English opening wasn't so much wet lettuce, but an aggressive weapon in this game. <laughs> uh, but it was precision play by White to make sure he wasn't allowing the liberating d5 with too much of effect. So e5 is actually liked <laughs> from an engine point of view here, the move e5. It's one of those things which it's structure, it's, it's, there's nothing you can do to retract e5 once you've played it, but it does imply that maybe d6 is committal in itself to play d6 here. Th there's other ways of playing against this system. This seems a little bit committal. This whole e5, this structure seems committal for d5. Knight g e2, bishop e6. So knight d5 must be one of the best moves. If we see if we see d3, then d5 here. Pardon me. So d3 here. I think d5 black should be fine uh, it just it just um, I think Vladimir in the game had mentioned he was looking at d4 though for a little bit but uh, it's not so clear doesn't need to get involved in that so that's why I think he chose knight d5 just to stop the d5 break so bishop e7 and both sides castled knight ec3 seems logical enough Knight b4 seems a little bit a little bit suspect, but uh, tactically it seems justified to get onto d3 as well as put more pressure on d5. But uh, knight b4, okay. And 
and um, we saw knight takes e7 check here also knight f6 the engine likes as well Let's see this d3 here it's possible as well letting black have the dark square bishop it's plausible seems okay for white but um, knight takes e7 getting rid of the dark square bishop and now d3 in this position so keeping the latent threat of this a3 so it's a very committal move now from black to play d5 if, if the whole idea is it's revolving around the peace sacrifice what other alternatives okay so say bishop g4 what does it actually do for black softens white up a bit does it matter if a3 here white can play quietly maybe just playing for b4 now I don't think d5 is that effective in this position in fact what is this with f4 takes this is very interesting stuff for English opening connoisseurs so d5 control is, is maintained like this that's nice so anyway so d3 okay the peace sacrifice is implied with black playing d5 here which uh, I guess the engine's gonna not like too much so d takes c4 yes we've got yes doesn't find it too convincing so with Anime taking the knight asking for evidence here knight e4 looks to be one of the better moves in the circumstance not minding black playing later f5 here uh, you might also ask well what about d takes e4 he played bishop takes e4 but d takes e4 not as good maybe if uh, queen c2 here a5 this is a different situation and one which maybe isn't so good as the game okay but uh, what was the advantage of, of of Vlad's approach by playing bishop takes e4 he's reserving uh, d4 as an option so he isn't doubling his own pawns and he's really wanting to liberate this bishop if you know, black ever takes then his bishops kind of liberated on c1 so he doesn't mind the f5 tempo gain he wants to play for d4 and in fact after rook f8 d4 white looks to be better unfortunately yes um, if you get a bad opening it doesn't matter how resourceful you are sometimes on these one day games especially with increment you don't really want a bad opening to have to spend the rest of the day fighting it for uh, it's it's just it's like playing handicap chess here. It it is basically a, a piece down, playing a piece down. Unfortunately, uh, in this in this particular um, game, this is just a piece down. Now, if if Black had, well, let's let's look at taking here. Taking here, it's rookie one. Rook takes a5, for example. Now it's just it's just nasty. It's just nasty. It's a piece down, traveling on the e file. It's pretty nasty as well. If that becomes possible, so um, it's just an example. So e4, okay. But um, this this structure is really good. It's got some squares. It's got the e5 square, for example, to work with later. So f3, bishop d5. White just takes. Rook f5, queen d7. So that played rook e5. The engine really likes rook e5. So if bishop h3 out of interest, what would be. Um, well, white's still okay after bishop h3. If g6, then there's check. That actually contains a threat as well. Check. But, you know, what, it, what he played is strong as well. So what is white actually threatening? Let's just check this out. White is actually threatening 
uh, bishop takes e4 and also queen c2 if needed as well okay principal threats just on the e pawn with rook e5 okay so rook e8 and he protects the e pawn but now we see bishop h3 in this position looks like one of the stronger moves queen c6 exchange of rooks bishop d2 Is there anything better than Bishop E2? No, it seems logical enough. Just just get on with it and get a rook to F1. Queen H5 now is played. Uh, I don't think there's much else apart from Queen E7. Uh, let's just check out B5. If B5, Queen G4 now threatens what exactly? Queen G4. Queen G5. Queen C five. Okay. So Juliet went with Queen E seven and we saw Queen H five. Queen D eight protecting the bishop. Rook F one. What is white actually threatening here? Is the principal threat that I mentioned rook F five? Bishop F five might actually be threatened here. Just on h7, crashing down. Um, let's just demonstrate that. If if Black played b5, for example, then Bishop f5, g6, taking. Let's have a look at this line. And Rook f5, crushing. Amazing that. Okay, so that that's that's a major nasty in this position. So maybe that's why g6 was played against. Bishop f5, not rook f5. So we see queen e5, and now what is the actual threat? I, I would say it's bishop e6 is the main one for rook f7, yes. So rook a6 defending that. Bishop d7 is the crunching move which was played. Engine really likes bishop d7 here. I think uh, Judith could safely uh, think about resigning here. But uh, she plays on. Now this exchange sack, was it needed? Well, it seems really powerful in any case, even if um, even if there might have been technically, technically a better move, this, this seems strong enough just, just to uh, get two pawns for that exchange and still with a raging attack. So two pawns there for that exchange sack immediately. What is white's actual concrete threat? In this position, if given another move, well, White's threatening b7, okay. Also, b3, maybe to hold up later, a4, a cement position. But um, b7's on here, so queen c7 helps explain queen c7's on. So, queen d5, so threatening queen j and e4 check, so rook f8. It's it's just a piece down basically. It's just not nice. It's desperate in this position for black surely. Uh, so b5 just taken. Check now. Queen a7 looks 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 good enough. If if white tried to defend with, uh, I mean queen d5 looks plausible or not. Um, just Vlad kept the queens on. I mean, even though it's plausible, Vlad just kept, kept the queens on here. He just wants to keep. I think the threat bishop h6 is a menace. Bishop g5 or bishop h6, both menacing threats here. Bishop g5 for e5 later, and then bishop f6 is actually the most precise, it seems. Okay, so we see uh, g5, that's just taken. Queen c6. Now just queen e7. Just uh, it's pretty hopeless. If the if the rook moves, then there's uh, bishop f6. Oh well, it's it's nasty. It's actually a fourth mate in six now as well. Okay. Ouch. <laughs> the piece sack didn't work out well. So we saw in this game. In contrast uh, to the other English opening game, which we saw, 
I'm trying to go through them this morning. We saw the English opening with a vengeance in this game, showing you can get uh, a small irritating advantage, and Judith was irritated enough to sacrifice a piece, which uh, White was able to consolidate the extra piece. Uh, I think a key decision was not playing d takes e4, but rather bishop takes e4 to reserve d4. So some some very interesting technical decisions from Vladimir to emphasize uh, his extra piece. Especially the move bishop d7 later was a bit of a tactical stunner. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.